if you are a cross-platform developer, you need to basically consider every possible permutation. And that means a lot of work, or you try and do something that kind of levels the play in the field across the board. Hello, and welcome to Behind the Game, the podcast where we talk to experts in the gaming industry. Today, we are talking to Jamie Smith. He is a game designer at People Can Fly and has an extensive background working on games like Call of Duty. It is great to have Jamie here to share his insights into game mechanics and industry trends. Jamie, welcome. Just as a gaming fan myself, I have to know, like, which was your favorite to work on? Generally speaking, so the Hood Outlaws and Legends game, that from a development perspective and also from a player's perspective, in the sense that it was a small team with a limited kind of budget within two and a half years kind of development on a brand new IP with a new publisher with also the pandemic. So it was kind of like (laughs) this, uh, you know, spinning tail of lots of things that, you know, you you wouldn't necessarily wish upon yourself, but it kind of happened. And it's almost like an underdog kind of story. It's that kind of thing is, you know, there's a lot of forces pushing against the team and they managed to kind of deliver what was a new game on a new platform, which is PS5 at the time. But only for that reason, really. I mean, Call of Duty was great, but hood i don't think will be topped because of those circumstances i love a good underdog story (laughs) to to be frank so i think that's really inspiring especially to you know new game developers out there trying to develop their new ip so i'm do you have any really good insights on how you can build up your new ip and how to like build upon that Let's say for this Robin Hood game that you've got a fairly pronounced kind of well-known character, you know, even if you don't necessarily know exactly the folklore of Robin Hood, you know that he's some person that has a bow and arrow. The downside of that is, is that especially in the last 10 or 15 years, you've got the Tomb Raider franchise, The Last of Us, um, you know, Horizon, even some of the newer games like Ghost of Tsushima, they all have bow and arrows, which are super prominent kind of games. And if you go back to the previous thing I've just mentioned is, You've got this underdog story of a team that has a literal Robin Hood on the front cover of the game competing against what are established kind of brands at this point in an area that is their kind of bread and butter. So that would be the first area is to identify what are the important things with your particular game and also to learn from the best because these, especially in the case of Tomb Raider, there's been three iterations at this point with the bow and arrow they have they have made a lot of failures and a lot of successes that we can kind of learn from as a small team. So to do, to not deviate too much from what others have kind of learned would be the big kind of lesson in terms of that. And especially because it was a small team, we couldn't spread ourselves too thin in general. So you had all of this working against you. You had COVID, you had the small team, you had, um, you know, a small budget. So, I mean, how how did you do it? How? Like, how did it all come together? How did you make it happen? Yeah, so in, in general, when I joined the project, there was maybe 40 people kind of on the team. Um, so it was pretty small. And they had a demo running up until that point, which was you are playing as a band of kind of merry men. You sneak into a castle, you steal some gold, and then you extract. And then the the, the kind of the spin on that was is that there is also another team that's trying to do the same thing. Right. In terms of how we did it, that was there really early. Day, day one, when I joined the project, that mechanic, that whole flow is almost identical to what was in the final game kind of two and a half years later. So that is kind of the first takeaway is is just that to know what you're trying to make and to get that up and running as quickly as possible. And then the next side of that was we were looking for a publisher at the time. And it turned out that Focus Home Interactive, I think they're based in Paris, they're certainly based in France. They were doing dark and dingy medieval kind of games so basically the, our brand or what we were going for which was more like a, a game of thrones kind of universe appealed directly to their kind of portfolio so there's the two kind of sides of it is we've got the funding and we've kind of got the idea and then the team itself of 40 people we were slowly but surely in acquiring people that had experience in me- melee combat in stealth in you know ranged combat uh, all different aspects of the game so it was basically bringing in experience on board to something that was new I don't think a completely fresh team straight out of university, for example, would have been able to deliver that. So you need to kind of, you know, propagate those cool ideas with experienced kind of folks. So it's the combination of those kind of things. But in the case of a uh, PS5, because that was a brand new frontier, nobody had kind of, you know, got access to the consoles at that point. We had the dev kits. 
we couldn't look at a game that was on the shelf and we had to come up with our own ideas for, you know, how should it feel on the gamepad? How should we best utilize the triggers? Are we going to do something funky with the kind of touchpad? So that was some creative kind of freedom in that case. But uh, generally speaking, it was just being smart about, you know, how we gather the knowledge onto the team and then how we use that knowledge. I think it's a really interesting concept. I've been reading books from the industry about game design and things like that. Um, but please do get technical within your descriptions and like when you're talking about it. I might not know what you're talking about, but it's okay. I'm sure some of our listeners will. Um, but I do think it's interesting that you were working, you know, on a game for the PlayStation 5, which at the time it was almost impossible to get, right? Like <laughs> you could not get it. I searched for years. So is that not kind of scary in a sense to make a game for a console that almost nobody could get access to? Because if you can't get access to the console, then you can't get access to the game. So did that make you guys worried? Like, how did you kind of plan for that? Did you ever think about releasing it on a new console or, you know, PC or Steam? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. So there's many conversations during development about exactly that kind of topic. Um, not in terms of the hardware scarcity, because we didn't know that and kind of it was too late. We also right. didn't know about the, pan the pandemic was kind of going to crop up kind of either. And those two things kind of coalesced. Right. But the idea of um, should it be a last gen game like on Xbox One and PS4, for example, because that's got a larger install base. Should it be a PS5 release title and what became the series? And both of those came out within a week of each other. In, I'm based in the UK, so they both came out in late November of that time. So just before the Christmas break. And there was also conversations about, could we get this thing onto Game Pass? Because even right. though we don't necessarily know what the install base is, we definitely know there's millions of people that could potentially try it out if it was a Game Pass or you know PlayStation Plus kind of freebie. Um, right. So the, the other side of it was when it comes to the hardware, if you have cross-platform kind of play as well, which is another thing that's in the mix, then it becomes a 60 FPS versus 30 FPS kind of debate. And that was where we basically put the split with the consoles is PC, PS5, and Xbox Series all play together in the same pool. Uh, you can turn that off if you want. And the right. previous gen consoles all play in their own kind of smaller pool instead. Instead, But theoretically, it's a larger pool because there's a larger kind of install base on that front. So we just had to consider a few different things. Very cool. Do you have, I mean, obviously we're talking about PlayStation 5, but do you have a preferred platform? Well, one to make games for and then one to also play on. So like I'm a, I'm a Steam gamer, I'm a PC gamer, I like my mouse and keyboard, um, but I'm just interested to know from like a developer side, do you have a preference to play on? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I've not worked on the Switch and I've not worked on mobile just yet, so it definitely rules those out. But uh, as a player and a dev, for me, PlayStation every single day of the week. Um, so. When I first came into games, I was in the PS3 360 era, and I got to work on PS4 and the DualShock 4 before that released. So that was pretty cool to kind of see behind the curtain how that works, what they call their APIs, their kind of uh, developer net kind of profile, so you can see what things you've got access to as a developer and how you can utilize, say, the touchpad, for example, or the haptics that are in the game. And the same is true right. on PS5. And because there's a lot more kind of interest in toys on the controller, and especially because we were in that first wave of kind of games, you were almost like laying the groundwork for people that are kind of coming ahead of you. And as I said earlier, we didn't have a game that we could look at except for an Astrobot demo. So the Astrobot that was built into the PS5, we had a rudimentary version of that. And it was by my call in, very specifically me on the internal kind of dev net, it's called for PlayStation, to ask them to provide the full game because of how cool, you know, some of the toys that they kind of give. So everybody on that DevNet kind of process got access to that. But that was after the fact. We, we'd already shipped the game kind of by this point. So I am curious to know about your thoughts about the cross-play, you know, era that is coming along. Um, do you, are you pro-cross-play? Are you anti-cross-play um, from a developer side? Yeah, I mean, a quick one from a player side would be it depends if I'm winning. Um, but from a developer side, um, I, th I think most interestingly is that it increases the player pool for a game, which is more interesting mm -hmm. in the sense that it reduces the wait time for for the server. You know, if you've got a bigger pool to right. kind of play and there's more players, you get into a game kind of much quicker. So from that point of view, I think in the world of immediacy, that's a really big plus. Um, the downside of that is, is that you could potentially be playing against somebody on a different peripheral and we have to account for that in kind of development. So 
it, it actually makes it harder when you have a, a PC player on keyboard and mouse and a gamepad player. From a developer side, we have to consider what that means if we allow them into the same session. You know, maybe counteract. Yeah. In the case of Hood, for example, we had some smoke bombs, and those smoke bombs can block people's vision. That means that doesn't matter how much precision skill you have on keyboard and mouse, you can't see through the smoke bomb, for example. So those kind of things right. kind of crop up as well. Right. You were talking about faster queues, and I have to say, Overwatch is one of my favorite games, and it's cross-platform, and I still sometimes get like the longest queues for that game, and it makes me so like there's is is the game dead? I don't understand. Like sometimes <laughs> I have like seven, eight minute queues. It's Overwatch. The games are like ten minutes. Yeah. Sorry. And rant. <laughs> so and you like with especially with what we've seen lately with Xbox and everything, I think it's it's moving more to other action where close platform is here, like live services games that we're going to start to see less premium games and everything. From your perspective, how do you see the change in, in terms of how long it's going to take? Is something immediately? Do you think there will be new tools for you guys to, to get adapted to that? Because it feels like from the last Griffin Gaming report, many people in the industry is 100% convinced that this is already here and this trend is just going to increase. Yeah, it, it's a great question because even when you think of something as simple as like a, a mobile phone and you have a touch screen and they're at a point now when you see demos of Resident Evil and they're pretty much like a high profile game, full fidelity that you can now play on a touch screen rather than a gamepad, even from a control scheme point of view, that's a big concern in terms of how you aim, you know, how you put your thumbs on the screen, but now you can't see the enemy that's kind of coming off the screen. So there's that kind of side of it. The other kind of side of it is the fidelity of the game itself. You know, basically, is it about high performance? Is it about kind of high frame rate? As I said earlier, we decided to make that split of kind of 60 versus 30. But do we have to make all of the skews of the game fit 60 FPS? Therefore, we lower the top barrier of the highest kind of performing kind of consoles or wherever it may be, or do we split the kind of audience? So that's a kind of another factor. Um, and yeah, just, just related to the control scheme, you see that in Destiny. I think Destiny might be in the first game that did this, which is the hovering kind of cursor interface. And typically speaking, before Destiny came around, your choice was make a good PC interface and adapt it kind of poorly to console, which is what I would say Final Fantasy XIV is doing, for example. It, it's a very kind of cumbersome interface. Or you make a great console interface that didn't adapt to PC. A keyboard and mouse so you know the high resolution is more icons on the screen so that's what the other side of it or you do both which is what diablo 3 kind of did a very good pc interface and a very good console interface or you do what destiny did which is you make a cursor and every single menu in the game is a cursor which means if you're on console you can move the cursor around with the analog stick if you're on pc you can move the cursor around with the mouse because obviously it's a mouse cursor and if you're on touch screen it's your your finger is the cursor. So I think that's where that kind of stuff comes from as well. So it will be more like from fr from now on, it will be something that will be thought when it comes to the design of the game and how you want the players to, to you know, to have the experience depending on the platform, right? Because talking about poor adaptations, I'm a Nintendo Switch player, so I, I, I feel that <laughs> I feel that as a player and it hurts. But but now thinking ahead future, it, it, it will be like a different process, right? When it comes to designing that years ago, maybe it's something that you wouldn't think about it. And, and now you, you have to you have to just to adapt the new times to that, right? Yeah. And, and also it goes back to that previous question about, you know, what's your favorite kind of platform? You know, so, some people might want a yeah. high resolution monitor and a keyboard and mouse. And that's one particular audience. But that's not the same as somebody who is on a Switch, for example, a handheld, sw handheld Switch with a 720 screen, and they're on a train, and they can't really hear the audio, and they have to use these kind of buttons on it. But you have to account for all kind of instances. And the reason I said about PlayStation earlier is, if you work on a PlayStation-only game, you only need to care about the PlayStation, and eventually PC, because now some PlayStation games are coming to PC. If you are a right. cross-platform right. developer, you need to basically consider every possible permutation and that means a lot of work or you try and do something that kind of levels the play in the field across the board so that that destiny kind of cursor menu example is trying to level, level the playing field or else they would have to do 
a mobile interface and a console interface and a PC interface, which is potentially three times the work. You've worked on Call of Duty, so I'm really interested. Do you ever see Call of Duty going cross-platform to the point of it being on like mobile? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the, the current version of Call of Duty that is on mobile is not the same game. Uh -huh. I, I think it's called Call of Duty Mobile, yeah. but it, it's not the same servers. It's not necessarily okay. the same maps, you know, different progression and things like that. Um, if, if, you, if you're judging it by the, the maybe the, um, the Fortnite example, then absolutely yes, which is Fortnite is playable on pretty much everything. There's no reason for them not to be there. But, but also, I think right. the Call of Duty mobile experience caters towards a different audience. And I might be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure it's kind of like there's a Far East kind of audience that loves that kind of experience. And even if they wanted to, you know, over overwrite that, that they would have to count for who are the existing players that don't necessarily want to play the console experience. You know, they're quite happy with the you know, the touchpad on the screen and, you know, what, whatever that changes with the pacing and the aiming kind of skill in the game. Obviously, Call of Duty is amazingly successful, right? But so is Fortnite. Do you think the re like it being so cross-play is a reason to Fortnite's success? Mm, maybe. Um, I, think, I think back in the day when people used to talk about World of Warcraft being successful and a big part of it was because they had a low barrier for entry in terms of PC specifications, Maybe that's right. the case with kind of Fortnite as well, which is okay. it, it can play on everything because it's not necessarily demanded on every single piece of hardware. And I think that that's basically what enables the mobile play is the graphical fidelity. You know, even the fact that Fortnite is not a hyper realistic game plays in its favor right. because it doesn't need to look fantastic on mobile. It just needs to look good enough. And the cell shaded art style, you know, you're looking at something that's 12 inches from your face. That looks pretty good at that kind of size. Right. I guess that was a loaded question because Fortnite is kind of very innovative. Like they did a lot of, you know, IPs. It's not a game anymore. It started like a game. Now it's more like a metaverse. It's, it's just yeah. right now you have so many right. possibilities inside for Fortnite. You have the creator mode, you have the, this music mode, you have lego mode as well they will probably release it more they did this collaboration with disney that we we probably will see like having a theme park inside of a game so it's already like a metaverse is their own is their own thing right now how do you see this trend of having so many moving everything so much into live services and live operations in gaming because it seems like we're gonna still see in premium games right but we start seeing yeah. more and more live services in, in, in games that are AAA or games for console and PC. What, what are your thoughts about it? I'm a big fan of, or a big advocate of kind of player choice. So in general, you know, you can get a Game Pass subscription, subscription, you can get access to kind of 500 games, but people like to go back to, I find, what they're familiar with. And even the thing you mentioned about the metaverse and all these new kind of skews with Fortnite, I think it's more just a habit and a routine that players have got, which is I've got one hour spare. Should I download one of those 500 games from Game Pass that I have access to, or should I just jump in with my friends? It's our quick kind of catch up. It's a one hour in a familiar kind of game. Um, some people don't even play Fortnite to get the win. You know, it's just a case of I'm going to chop yeah. some tree down, trees down and, you know, blow some stuff up and talk to my friends. And that's their <laughs> kind of social kind of yeah. space. So. I think that's one side of it. And the Call of Duty kind of example, I don't necessarily think that's the case because especially when I play Call of Duty, I want to concentrate on the action, especially if it's a, you know, a small scale, hectic kind of map. So I, th I think another part of it is not just a habit, but what's the type of experience that they create into the player. Rocket League is a good example of a game where you don't really need to pay attention to it. Call of Duty, I do feel like for the precision skill and your environmental kind of spatial awareness, you definitely do. So it's a combination of that. But I think it all comes back to kind of habits and familiarity. Do you think the user behavior changed from COVID? C certainly in terms of um, probably having more patience with the game because, you know, there's more time at home, you know, maybe with busy kind of lives now, as you mentioned earlier with the Overwatch example, people don't want to wait five minutes to be a DPS kind of player. At the same time, if you're working from home or you, you, during the pandemic, you've got more time to, to be less precious about that kind of stuff. But I don't really know if player behavior has kind of changed. I think the one thing that probably def definitely changed is what what habits have formed in particular games. You know, Warzone, I think, launched on Call of Duty right at the start of COVID or what, what became the pandemic at the perfect time kind of where people were at home and they were looking for a new experience. And it just so happened to be the best first person gunplay in the industry for free. 
and you know and you can play with your friends so you know i, I think part of it was just circumstance and happenstance uh, more, more than anything else yeah really good timing it's like when diablo i think four released and then there was all those fires and they had like the billboard in new york and so it was like super red and creepy looking <laughs> like marketing could not have planned for that it yeah. was just really good timing <laughs> so I always like to kind of ask this question, but how did you find yourself in the gaming industry? What led you here? I know you do a lot of mentorship, so um, how you know how did that all lead to where you are now? Yeah, I mean the, the the long story short is kind of that I've been in games for about fourteen years, um, but when I first got into games, it was from a university course, and prior to that, a design course. The design course and the university are both based in the northeast of the UK which I can describe as almost like a mini Silicon Valley. So there's lots of people that were making games in the N64 kind of era that were teaching on these kind of courses that were kind of local. And it just so happened the design course that I went to at my college is the same one that Ridley Scott and Tony Scott both went to as well. And that's the, the area that I'm from is the inspiration for Blade Runner. And they, they graduated from that college. So the combination of those things is there are cool kind of design courses in my local area. There are people who have worked on games that I played as I was growing up in the N64 kind of era. And then I had a university right. that led to a games job, which was uh, maybe 40 miles from where I am at Ubisoft. And uh, I got that job from what was uh, kind of a Dragon's Den experience. You've got some people on one side of the table critiquing a presentation, and I was delivering that presentation. Whoever won the competition uh, basically got an internship at Ubisoft. And then that basically led me to where I am today, kind of 14 years later. Wow, that's that's a pretty cool story. Yeah. Um, I feel like not many people have that story. A lot of people are like, well, it just kind of happened. It just kind of fell into it. Um, has your motivation changed? You know, you kind of started as a student. So, you know, we're working really hard. But now, you, you know, you do a lot of other things. You're probably top level. So how has your motivation changed over the years? Yeah, th th this is a fantastic question, actually. Um, I think when, when you first join in games, you, you are very eager in terms of, I want to get my ideas into the game. You know, uh, I would really like to change that thing in Overwatch because now I'm on the project or, I you know, this thing's really bugged me on this game and now I can kind of finally fix it. So you, you're kind of full of ideas. You want to keep adding things to development. The downside is, is that um, ideas are extremely cheap, but to realize those ideas is very expensive. You know, if you're going to add a new weapon to a game, you've got the modeling, you've got the animations, you've got the VFX, you've got the audio, you can come up with the, the world's craziest kind of rocket launcher example in your head, but to kind of actualize that is, is a bit more difficult. So I think later in your career, you soon realize that removing things from the game or reusing the kind of Lego bricks in the tub that you already have is much more economical, but also much more creative as well. So if you think if you're making a Lego kind of model, imagine if you took that apart, you can make anything you want but you can only use that Lego kit. You can only use the pieces that you're kind of given. I think that's the big change. And the other one I would probably say is uh, now I'm really looking for just enjoyment in day to day. Um, I think the pandemic has kind of showed a lot of people that um, you know you you just want to make the most of your time, whether it be through flexible kind of working, doing something kind of meaningful, spending more time on kind of yourself, you know, self care, going to the gym, wherever that may be. So now I'm just looking for you know meaningful creative input kind of every day and a lot of the time that doesn't necessarily mean adding ideas to the game it's just adding value i have to give one more rant about overwatch and then i promise i'll be done <laughs> but when you're in competitive and someone leaves they do not give the option to remake so if you please somebody fix that <laughs> i don't know who i have to ask but please somebody fix that because then you just automatically lose and then you know you lose rank and <laughs> and rant but yeah, so I could see how like if you're a new aspiring developer and you're like, oh, I want to change this about Overwatch and you get really excited and then you get in there and you're like, oh, wow. OK, so to change this one little thing, I have to, you know, do X, Y and Z. Again, I'm not a designer, so I don't know what X, Y and Z are, but um, I could definitely see how ambition can be kind of um you know, really exciting at first. And then maybe, I don't know if you're like a new game designer, you kind of get in and that ambition kind of goes away, right? Because you see how much work it takes and maybe you get told no a lot by it's, superiors. And it's what we were talking before. It's like when you start in the industry, you, you, especially if you're on the creative side, you start full of passion 
because in your mind in, in your head it's like okay i just want to do this let's do it but you don't know all the business decisions that are behind that you don't know all the things that you need to move to do that so i guess it's like just a cold water reality check like when you when you see all that is behind the scenes and how you need to make it then you go down then you start finding your own way right and then you get to a moment that okay just let's do meaningful ideas let's do things that are going to be actually impactful and i can enjoy right exactly and, and i think the other way i'd describe even that sensation is especially if you come in new into the industry maybe even on a triple a kind of scale like i did you don't know what you don't know and it's exactly the stuff that you mentioned is you just think i'm going to add these brand new fancy cars to the game and i'm going to add five new characters to overwatch and the reality is you don't know the business decisions you don't know how that's going to affect the kind of community how you got to factor in the balance of the game now that you've got additional servers because there's more players that are going to get brought to the game and every single decision has kind of a knock-on effect but it, it's interesting when you said about kind of um the cold water or the shock kind of side i think it's just more about awareness and especially on the design side it's the pragmatism to work within goalposts you know you can do whatever you want but you can only do it within this particular bound you can be as creative as possible whereas i do find that some graduates that come into the industry their ambition is kind of to make grand theft auto and that's all they want to make and it's that's probably one of the most difficult experiences that you can create and the reality is you know you're not going to hand the reins of somebody who comes into the games industry the the ability to make that kind of scale game on their own because it's 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 just not feasible but equally something that is really high profile as well as something that you don't tend to work on straight away so if you take mario for example your first day in the industry you will absolutely not be touching mario you know you'll be looking at some small tiny aspect of the game that is in some cases could be in insignificant but you build up that kind of credit and that knowledge over time where at some point now you can control mario's behaviors and his abilities and stuff so when you do see these new fresh you know just fresh off of the graduation and they have all this ambition how do you you know how do you put everything that we've said into a way that doesn't just automatically kill their ambition how do you mentor yep. these people to be still effective and still proud of their work yeah, that, that, that's super cool. So I'm a big fan of, um, you, you know, when you get, um, I, for, I forget the name of it, but basically when comedians basically like to follow on what the next person is, improvisational kind of side of it, which is, oh, that's a real cool idea. And we, and we could all also do this and we can also do that. And that can spiral out of control, at least on paper, because it doesn't really cost anything. It's, it's just kind of a brain dump. It's a conversation. But when it comes to kind of bringing that thing to life, it's about trying to find what is the minimum what we call the minimum viable product and it might be the same in kind of mobile as well is what is the lowest yeah mvp it's it's a really simple concept that anybody can kind of pick up which is what is the minimum version of that thing that you're trying to come up with that proves it should then lead to something much bigger and much greater and most importantly is if if you're looking to make a bike for example the goal of a bike is to get from a to b it doesn't matter if you end up with a skateboard, it still serves the same purpose and you just want to get from A to B and prove that concept out as quickly as possible. Uh, and also you might find that you you don't want a bike is actually you wanted a car instead, but the concept of being able to kind of showcase that, you know, from A to B, but it's, it's not about kind of killing somebody's dreams. It's just about managing the ambition, I think is the key bit. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, empowering that comes behind mentoring. So. I'm just curious, do you have a favorite story, you know, a favorite, um, I guess, mm, sen not sensei, uh, you know, Padawan, I guess, so to say, of your, like, a favorite story you can share? Yeah, I, th I think one cool one is we were working on some projects where, especially in Hood Outlaws and Legends, it had a stealth component to that particular game. And the, the game and the project in general was going pretty well. We had multiple playable characters. It was playable online. And I think at one point we had a bit of trouble with the, the stealth component of the game, which was pe people perceived or they felt that stealth was not very useful in the experience. So instead of sneaking up behind a guard and kind of taking them out quietly, people would just run full force kind of right in front of them. And then in terms of the team that was kind of looking at that stuff, they hadn't necessarily considered what the top um, you know, stealth games were doing at that particular time in the sense of, if you're in crouch, you're almost invisible. 
um, the enemies in the game are there to serve the purpose of the game and not necessarily to reflect kind of real life. Because sometimes stealth games, what people criticize is that the AI is dumb. And that's fine. Right. If the AI was smart, it would not be a fun game. So it's, it's basically about taking these kind of lessons and then in providing those to what was the AI team at the time, but through the conduit of another designer. So we had worked together to kind of showcase what were all the successful kind of you know stealth games doing? How can you promote stealth as much as possible? And providing that ammunition for him to kind of bring that back to the rest of the team and say, hey, here's some stuff that we could do. So even some of the simple stuff is if an enemy is stood on a tower, think of it like Lord of the Rings, you know, they're on the top of the balustrades, the enemies can't see down, they can't see below them. That, that's an intentional kind of design choice where the player can sneak from below, for example. And it, yeah, basically just providing those examples. And within weeks, you know, that the game was transformed. You know, everybody started in crouch. They started sneaking up on guards. They were working together to do multiple kind of takedowns. And it, there, there was some people that sometimes would go full frontal assault, but they would get extremely punished, um, you know, because they weren't necessarily encouraged to play that way, you know, after we'd made these changes. During your mentoring, have you ever come across somebody who is just really, really headstrong and you maybe have seen that they don't necessarily fit in the corporate world or like the big studios and you've just been like, hey, honestly, I think you're great, but I think you should go and do your own thing. Have you ever like had that kind of issue come across uh, not not to the point of kind of you know exiting somebody from the company or from the project but definitely to the point of when you say headstrong um d d designers in general can be guilty of getting precious over their ideas and it it can be difficult to kind of sway them away from what is best for the game is not necessarily what is best for their cv and in some cases right. you, know, you have to curve people towards hey here's a cool idea that's great, but it might not necessarily fit this particular experience. And I think uh, the thing to kind of catch early with that is, is to not let that mindset kind of fester for too long, because the more that people invest in the idea or their thoughts in that idea, the more difficult it becomes to kind of take it away. And it's especially difficult if that idea has made its way into the game. Um, you get right. the sunk cost kind of fallacy where we spent six months making this thing, a designer really loves it, but the best thing to do is take that out of the game. That's when you kind of handle that kind of resistance. So it, it's never got to the point of where it's ended up in kind of bad blood or anything, but you definitely have to manage those scenarios pretty early because, uh, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law. That's, that's how I like to present it. That makes sense. And I'm sure you've maybe answered this question a lot and it's something that we always end on. If I don't know if you've listened to any of our other episodes in the podcast, but we always like to ask people if you could go back in time and give yourself, and maybe you've already done this because you are such a mentor to some you know, younger people, but if you could go back in time and give yourself a cheat code to where you are now and to accelerate your career, what would it be? I think um, the technologies were just coming online when I was you know, basically breaking into the industry. And what I mean by that is uh, Unreal Engine is kind of ubiquitous now. And that's a common piece of feedback people will say for your portfolio is, you know, make lots of demos, put them on a website, you know, make them available. I think when I was first getting into games, those tools weren't that weren't very kind of ubiquitous. So it would have been, how can you demonstrate your kind of skills to people? And I probably would have said, go, go into computer science, um, you know, the CS50 in kind of the States, for example, or something comparable to that. You can learn design easily but to fall back on kind of a skill that can kind of bring your ideas to life, it's a bit different these days because anybody can jump in Unreal and you can have a game up and running in kind of no time. But generally speaking, more of a technical kind of proficiency earlier would, would have been much greater. Very cool. All right. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure. Thanks for reaching out on LinkedIn. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed. If you did enjoy, please check out all of our other episodes and please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and we will see you in the next one. Bye.